today with Natasia D'Souza, an intuitive eating expert. And this is a field that is more common in North America, I would say. And I was really happy to find you, uh, come across you and connect with you in the UAE because I think this is very necessary. So welcome to the Live Healthy Podcast. And right Thank off you. the top, we just need to explain to people what is intuitive eating and why do you need a coach for it? So intuitive eating is basically ditching diet culture. All those do's and don'ts. Yes, you should. No, you shouldn't have carbs. Um, you know, this is good for you. Asparagus at night, uh, chicken not after seven. All those diet rules that you've read in all your magazines or have been taught, and the military diet, the cabbage soup diet, all of that gets thrown out the window. And it's really learning to trust your intuition. You know, um, over the years, especially people that have struggled with food, people that struggle with overeating, they forget their basic sick hunger cues. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. I'm full. Uh, I'm craving uh, um, a sweet item. I'm craving, you know, potatoes. Uh, we've been taught that cert craving certain things or even having a craving in general is bad. So it's basically going back down to the roots, teaching an individual what those feelings are, how to accept them, how to be okay with it. Because nine times out of 10, because this individual hasn't experienced it for so long, they think it's wrong, right? They go by what they see on Instagram, what they're reading. Uh, this is good for me. This isn't. So it's just teaching them the basics of really learning to trust themselves. And of course, you know, I experienced all of that in the nineties and it was confusing enough because it was magazines and it was television. But I, I can't even imagine now because I have my head on pretty straight, but I still get all the time kerflustered when I go on to Instagram or other forms of social media, because then you'll just see something else you hadn't even thought of. And your brain's sort of like, I need to do that. So how much more complicated do you think this has gotten for people, this diet culture? Um, it's gotten so complicated, right? Because everyone now has an opinion. Everyone will tell you, uh, well, you should be having apple cider vinegar after your meal. You should be not eating carbs after 7 p.m. You should not have dairy at this time of the day. And so everyone has an opinion and uh, social media being the length that it is at the moment, the exposure, people are on there for hours on end trying these different techniques and looking at other people's results and believing that it will work for them as well. And in turn, the damage that it's doing to them internally, psychologically, on how they view themselves, their self-esteem, um, and they've lost that trust. They've lost the ability to know that they too have wants and needs, but they've kind of suppressed it and shunned it because the other individual now that probably has over 200,000 followers, has a body of a goddess, uh, has more of a say than them themselves so in turn when they start feeling those basic hunger cues um you know fullness cues or thirst cues they ignore them because they was like no this is wrong i shouldn't be feeling this or if they've had a cupcake then it's like oh i'm guilty so i might as well get into a different kind of cycle which is where the binge and restrict cycle comes in as well so it's honestly it's it's really complicated it to a to a next level and it's sad it's sad to see on my end sometimes when you see clients and individuals struggling um basically because of what they see on social media and how they believe that that's now their way and their norm of life what do you think is going on with a lot of the people on social media who are perpetuating this is it like they've come up with a plan and they're per persuasive why doesn't it work like why don't these plans end up usually working or do they I, I don't know it's a hit or miss so I, I believe that they would work but they wouldn't work on an individual struggling with emotional eating they wouldn't work on an individual struggling with an eating disorder such as anorexia or binge eating for that matter I struggled with binge eating and I've gone from diet to diet to diet and it was just a temporary restriction phase for me till the time that I got off and then I just wanted to binge, right? And what tends to happen in a certain degree, this has changed over the years, 
But these individuals are providing these diets to people struggling on an emotional level, not taking into account that fact, not taking into account that if I restrict and put this individual on 1200 calories or tell her she cannot have carbs, I'm actually putting her into a rut, um, you know, doing more harm than I am even good. And certain individuals, unfortunately, don't take that into factor. This is changing over time. I am noticing more nutritionists, more trainers, you know, opening up that pathway and saying, are you really struggling with food? Maybe we don't eliminate things entirely, which is so, it's so helpful. It's so helpful to work with these people, especially trainers that some of my clients see because you can have a conversation with them and they get it. They want to get your client to the same goal, but they don't want to do it in a manner which is abusive to the individual's mental health for lack of a better word to be honest with you and and i think that's that's the main factor here if mental health was taken more into consideration when giving out these plans and diets specifically for those struggling with food as a coping mechanism then they wouldn't be in this rut but that's unfortunately not been taken into account okay so um let tell us about your own experience because you lost 65 kgs and struggled with all of this before and clearly found, you know, your path through. And so can you just talk to us about how that all got started that uh, your emotional eating, your weight struggles? Absolutely. So my emotional eating started when I was really young. Um, I was a victim of sexual trauma and food became my best friend. It was something I relied on for comfort. And I was always known as the big child, you know, and that I kind of carried that name with pride as I grew older. And food was my solace. Food was my go to at every given point in time. I only noticed the obsession I had for food after I lost all the weight, because I just kept, I just, it became a norm for me to eat big amounts of food. It became a norm for me to grab three, four ice creams on my way home from work. That was just the norm and I accepted it. But it was only after I'd been to the doctor and he put me on a strict diet, which was no carbs, just, just protein, just vegetables for two years. And I lost all the weight, which was great. And then two years later, I even remember asking my doctor, what do I do now? And my doctor said, well, now you live your life. You do everything that you've never done on the years that you've grown up overweight. And that's what I did. I went back to my old lifestyle. And before you knew it, I gained back 40 kilos. And then what happened was when I started noting obsession with food. I started noting I wanted to eat food when I was lonely. I wanted to eat food when I was stressed. I started to notice things of me wanting to binge eat to a maximum level where my stomach would hurt with pain. Uh, and then wanting to make myself starve for days on end to make up for those binge eating episodes. And that's when I really had to slow myself down and tell myself something is not right here. It cannot just be diet and exercise because I now love to exercise and I, I'm trying these diets, but I have an obsession with food. My thought process around food is not right. Why is it that I feel if I've had a stressful day at work that I deserve food? Why is, and then if I compared myself to a friend, a colleague, they don't look at food at the same way, which made me then not look at myself as abnormal, but make me realize that something's not right. Something along the way, as far as my my wiring goes on how I view food and how food provides me that comfort was not right. And that's when I had to dive into it deeper. That's when I started learning things such as mindful eating, emotional eating, train myself on cognitive behavioral therapy for eating disorders, understanding the fact that I was struggling with binge eating and really accepting that fact because, you know, it's hard for people to say, I am a binge eater. I am a binge and purger. I am anorexic. So really accepting that fact and going through recovery from that standpoint, rather than just going through the, the ideal that's put out there, well, you're overweight, you just have to eat right and work out and really paving that path for myself. And now for others, in a way that, yes, I do struggle with weight, and I do struggle with food. But it's because I need to rewire the way I look at food, I need to create a healthy relationship with food, go back down to the basics and not just be put on another diet to get to the healthier, healthier life that I want for myself. Can you talk a little bit about, you said it's hard for people to say, I am a binge eater or I am, there is a distance between that behavior and yourself. Is it, a, 
disconnection between our very essence of ourselves or our bodies, because it's very easy to be a binge eater and not think you're a binge eater, right? Like it's, it's, you're, there's this fundamental disconnect there, but I'm wondering if it's a wider issue of being disconnected from yourself and your emotions when you feel them. Can you sort of talk about that piece of it? Absolutely. So there is a huge disconnect and it happens for one of two reasons. One, um, lack of awareness, not being aware that you're actually in a binge and restrict cycle and maybe normalizing it as something as overeating, not knowing the actual characteristics of what binging, binge eating is. So that would, that again, would not would not give you the entitlement let's say to put you in that category the second basis of it that i tend to see is denial right understanding all the characteristics understanding that you are in the binge and restrict cycle but not wanting to identify as one because now that puts you into a category that that could be demeaning that could be frowned upon in society so the two of those are the two of the main reasons that people would shy away from identifying themselves as binge eater now the first scenario uh, is let's say easier to handle because awareness, knowledge, then allows the individual to look at that area, explore the possibilities, look at certain uh, recovery routes and outcomes and take it from there. Someone who's in denial uh, doesn't even want to fess up to, I am a binge eater and this is what I'm doing. They're like, no, I'm just overeating. Give me my next diet. Give me my next plan. I'll do better. So then the individual who is in denial and who doesn't want to by choice put themselves into that category tends to struggle a bit more until they can actually accept that fact and say you know what this is what I struggle with doesn't matter that it has a title doesn't matter that it's a disorder but it all that matters is there is a path of recovery to me and I can get there and does it always stem from some sort of trauma in your childhood that you're you're disassociating from or you have disassociated from or is it possible to heal that trauma and then still experience the emotional eating or not have that kind of trauma and experience the emotional eating. It not it, trauma is a key component. I will say that having been through trauma myself, having over 70% of my clients been to trauma as well as, as, as well, it is a key component. I do see the trends um, as far as trauma is related. However, that being said, I do have clients as well that have not been through any trauma, but are, mainly due to environmental factors, you know, being raised in a household where food was abundance, you know, being taught you cannot leave the dining table without finishing your plate of food. Um, maybe a parent in the family ha- has struggled with binge eating themselves because you can pick up these tendencies from parents. They might have, it's also, it, it, there's also a gene um, that could further for the, take your binge eating to a next level, let's say. The percentage of that is 5% to minimal, but there are other factors other than trauma. You could have healed from trauma and then been put into a very st- stressful situation. And this is one I tend to see as well, entering college, moving away from home for the first time, you know, uh, putting on, uh, being explored to all these food options rather than home cooked food, uh, navigating through how to uh, be away from home, learning to be an adult, uh, learning to get good grades in university, which is nothing like high school and then becoming this new individual I tend to see a lot of binge eating coping mechanisms being picked up at this stage of an individual's life cycle as well so not necessarily trauma and an individual could have healed from trauma but major at least from my clients 70 percent of them have been through some sort of physical trauma sexual trauma you know of something of that sort but it could stem from other areas of life as well Okay, so walk us through how you start to dismantle this diet culture and start to become in tune with your own cravings, uh, your body's own needs, and coming back to your own emotional needs over whatever everyone else is saying about what you're supposed to do. So the the way I usually start start out with my program, I, I do a six month program. I don't believe in quick fixes. We're here to really slow things down, rewire things, look at the way you're actually thinking. So in the first two weeks, I actually ask people, I, I don't even ask them about their weight. I don't even ask them about, you know, anything to do as far as calories are concerned. I just want to know what they do why they do it and how they do it in specific in regards to their eating habits. So they will then get a journal of uh, what they're eating, why they're eating it, 
what time of the day they're eating it and how do they feel before or after eating the item right? Am I stressed? Am I eating over the sink? Am I eating in the car on my way home? Do I have a specific couch? So what we're trying to identify here is their physical triggers, their emotional triggers, their food triggers, their people triggers. You know, did uh, this Kathy at work, this, every time she comes in with her salad, is that a trigger for me to go to my car and get a chocolate bar? It's these little things that we've done on an automated level for so long that we don't even realize we're doing it. So we're really trying to slow that process down for this individual and see what they do, how they do it, and when they do it. Once we're able to identify this, then we then ask the individual to kind of let go of any diet mentality they have. And by that, I by that I mean is understanding their food rules. So what is it that they eat on a daily basis? So sometimes you'll hear someone saying, Oh, Natasha, um, no, I, I can't, I can't have uh, dairy after seven because it really makes me bloat and it affects the scale. So then it's breaking down that path and let's say, let's have dairy and who made you believe this and how can we break that? And it's also in relation to what their ultimate goal is. So if an individual, I get individuals from different areas of life wanting different outcomes. So if an individual is obese and struggling with weight loss, then it's going down to why they're binge eating and breaking those components down. But say I have an individual that, is a bikini competitor, but is not struggling with weight loss or weight issues whatsoever, but strictly struggling with binge eating, then it's going into the, the back end of things and looking at their thought process. Where did the restriction mentality come in? Why do we only think that 100 grams of broccoli and 100 grams of chicken will make us feel satiated? And what would happen if you don't have 100 grams of broccoli and you decide to have 200 grams of fried tilapia how would that change and really testing the individual's boundaries which is not very pleasant and i'm usually on the receiving end of that but i love it i and then i always tell them that's what i'm here for testing the individual's boundaries bringing them to the other side and letting them know that they're safe more often than not the reason why this individual has these food rules or believes that this item is bad for them is they believe that if they continue doing what is right for their body they're not going to be safe. The response is going to be wrong. The scale is going to go up. They're, they're not going to be accepted in society or they're not doing what others in their community or work or school are doing. So it's really a, creating a safety net for them more in relation to what their outcome and desire is and saying, you actually can, you actually can build a trust and you can get, you can get to the other side without those rules surrounding you and guiding them very securely and safely through that process. And, you know, I, this sort of has come about around the time of the body positivity movement. So is there an element of accepting your body the way it is at different times and stages? Like, is that a piece of it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And this is something I say all the time. There is no reason why you cannot love your body today while working on the body that you want for yourself. Whether you're overweight, whether you're 300 pounds, whether you're 400 pounds, there is no reason. You can love your body today and work towards a better you. It actually makes the process easier. And I say this oftentimes to friends, to clients as well, that if I had known this when I was first losing my 100 and, you know, when I was 145 kilos, it would have changed the game for me entirely. I wouldn't have hated the process. I would have actually loved waking up as an individual, loved the process and work towards a better me rather than saying, I hate what I look, I hate what I see in the mirror. I can't stand it. So I need to use that fuel and that hatred towards getting to a better, get better person. And to that, I would say, who ma what makes you think that when you get to your goal weight, you're going to love yourself then. If you can't love yourself now, what makes you think that when you get to your goal weight, you're going to love yourself then? And I always use this as an example because I primarily believe the reason I gained back those 40 kilos as fast as I did is because I couldn't accept myself then. I didn't know how to love myself then because I wasn't thought the importance of loving myself at 326 pounds. And that made staying there so much harder because I seen that as a temporary, you know, a temporary stage in my life and it was going to get taken away from me. So absolutely body positivity is is so important. It's so important. And it breaks my heart to see, you know, how much it lacks in, in women 
Sometimes I ask women, you know, tell me three body parts that you love about yourself. And they struggle. They struggle so hard with this question. And I'll get things like my fingernails, my eyelashes. And then I turn back and say, dig deeper, dig deeper. They're like, um, maybe my collarbone, you know, and it's, it, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking, but it's really getting them away from that and start having them appreciate things like their thighs, their knees, their waistline, right? And not just looking at things like, oh, my flabby arms, my stomach and things of that sort, but really embracing the parts of them that make them that individual and learning and growing from there. Well, it makes sense. I mean, nothing nothing happens when you're at war with yourself, it's Absolutely. sort of ending this war with yourself. And then you can sort of, whoever is inside your head fighting, you can go ahead and a bit of peace and then achieve whatever you want to achieve. Now, is it mostly women that you work with, but, or do men have? I do. I have, so I've started working with men this year, uh, but I do work primarily with women. So 70% of my clientele is women. The other 30% is men. Um, and, you know, men for me was, it was whether it was a personal choice or whether I wanted to open that door uh, for them or not, uh, because getting into things like intuitive eating, getting into things like emotional eating, why we do what we do, sharing areas of their life that are impacting their eating habits. Not all men are comfortable with that. Not all men want to dive deeper into, they just kind of want to get on with things. But if they're willing to open up that door and look into why they do what they do and how they can rewire that for success, then it's easier to work with. And the men that I have currently uh, as clients, um, they're amazing at it. They're willing to really look at themselves from the inside and saying, you know what, this is how I was conditioned. And this is not no longer serving me for my future. And I'm willing to do the work to change that for me. And that that's been that's been amazing. It's really been amazing seeing men showing up and stepping up in that regard. Um, and I, And I'm here for it. I really am. And people must have to just be ready for this. Like, it doesn't seem like it can be something that you can force on someone. Absolutely. They, they have to, you know, I always, I always tell people, I do an interview process before I bring a client on board because I don't want them to believe, especially with my weight loss journey, that I have some sort of miracle formula in my pocket that's going to get them to their goal weight. Uh, I don't want them to believe that this is just going to be a next diet plan, an exercise routine that they can now use to get the weight loss success that I gained, right? But actually, this takes work. This takes you looking at yourself from the inside. And when you look at yourself from the inside, there are going to be parts you're not going to like. There are going to be parts that are going to be very awful to look at, but we're not here to judge. We're here to bring them out, address them, you know, heal them if they need that healing and comfort, not dwell on them for too long, but change them for success. And that part, once they are okay with that, once they're comfortable with looking at themselves from the inside, it gets smooth sailing from there. Because then they realize that, failure is part of the process they realize that i'm not i'm not following a stick a, a strict standard guideline that is going to get me to my weight but actually i have some flaws that i can trip and fall along the way but i'm still moving forward so i always tell my clients remember we're always failing forward we're failing no matter what's happened we're always failing forward so that's the that's that's the main reason why i do my interview process because like I said, just don't want to have, don't want anyone having the wrong impression before they come on board that this is going to be the next quick fix or the next diet plan out there to get them their six pack abs. Okay. Well, that's just what great work you're doing. It's really, it's really great to talk to you, but it's all yeah. about sort of moderation. Like we, that's what we're about here at Live Healthy. Where can people find you and connect with you? Uh, they can find me on Instagram at Natasia D'Souza, or they can find me on my website at uh, www.natasiadesouza.com. You can send me a DM, an email with any inquiries or questions. I'm constantly posting tips, motivation on my Instagram. So that's where they can find me primarily. And you also have a podcast, Taking the Weight Out of Weight Loss. Yes, I do. I do. I do. We've, we've, um, with the sudden surge of clients at the moment, I'm actually at, 
beyond capacity at the moment with with everything that's happened and i'm so blessed i'm truly truly blessed uh, but with my group coaching and my one-on-one clients my podcast has has slowed its momentum down but i do have a podcast going i actually have someone coming on in the next two weeks uh who deals with hypnotherapy and you know childhood trauma and its relation to obesity so um they'll be able that that's a that's going to be an episode really worth tuning into okay awesome thank you so much natasia Thank you. It's my absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me.